Okay, this is a this is a, a real fun session, but it's also it can be a little bit uh, painful. Uh, yeah, I guess I see in the We're going to take a look at uh, desires, and we'll take a look at ten desires that are problematic. The the chicken. But let's first explain from a biblical perspective, all right, about desires. So turn your Bibles to James chapter one. Uh, verse twelve of James one talks about uh, persevering through temptation uh, and talks about the crown of life, which is uh, speaks of heaven. Uh, verse 13 talks about that we should that we can never accuse God of ever tempting us. Now verse 14 gets into uh, hunting terms. And fishing terms. Okay, so it says, but each person, so each person, that would mean if you are breathing. How many here are breathing? Okay. <laughs> so make sure he's got a pulse. Okay. Uh, <laughs> check your pulse. <laughs> Are you you're breathing from that room? Very important. Because I am not going to give you CPR. <laughs> okay, so every person, that means speaking to you and to me, is tempted. And what happens is that uh, we are tempted and then lured. And that's like a fishing lure. That looks good. Alright. And then also he talks about being enticed by his own desire. Drawn out by his own desire. Okay, so follow follow me. I'm back uh, in my hometown. It's a summer day. I'm stopped at a traffic light. Uh, I'm in my convertible. Adjusting my radio. And I see out of the corner of my eye uh, an object. All right, and I recognize. Uh, all right, it's. Uh, I and so I take a look. And I go back to my radio. Now this is what goes through my mind. Uh, Homo sapien Homo sapien walking on two feet. All right, uh, female. Uh, blonde. Uh, uh, halter top. All right. Uh, and then I take a second look. Now, at what point have I sinned? <laughs> Most people will say when I take the second look. But what the Bible teaches is the sin has already been conceived in my mind before I take action. Sin is conceived in the mind. Alright, now do this with your fingers. Okay, and then pull, pull them out. And take a look at that. For some people it's four inches. <laughs> For some of you guys, it's about eight inches. That's your battleground. 
Your battleground is in your mind. Now, if you take a look at verse 15, that's what it explains. Now, he shifts from hunting terms into the birthing, birth experience. So, he says, when desire meets temptation, there is a conception right? and then there is a birth and what he says at the end is that it is still born. Yes. And so it is very similar. You need temptation and desire. If you did not have the desire, there would never be any conception of sin. Now, in no way are we saying that the desire is always bad. But that's what the temptation plays on, is the desires. If we had a, a mouse uh, in the wall, and we got a mouse trap and put a, a, a thousand uh, left. And Joseph came in yet, me and the Nigrats, Mish, and I came even closer, and we got one of Nimi Lexha Drea. Would we catch the mouse? And the Gapi Mio? No, we'd catch Yoli, but not the mouse. You're in for you. What would we put on the trap? It's far better than those in the Gats Gap. Yeah. Why? Because that's the mouse's desire. <laughs> the mouse's desire and the cheese, they're the thing that causes All right. But now, if you go to James 125, All right. look what it says. When, all right, Bible study here, all right, we study the Bible, that's for our mind, and then we do it, he will be blessed. Now, the word blessing is interesting, and it morphs in the Bible. Uh, and in the New Testament, it talks about mostly relationships. But when God blesses you, it's the blessings of joy that no man can steal from you. You could have a brand new car and someone has keyed it in the parking lot uh, and your joy would not wane because your joy is in the Lord and not in these things and that's why the Bible says rejoice in the Lord always again I say so, so what we're going to be talking about in this session is the desires that can become sinful very easily. All right. So this is where we get think right, <coughs> do right, feel right. All right. Now when you go to a doctor and you say, I don't feel good, what do they want to do? What do they want to do? They want to make you feel good. They address the feelings. The Bible addresses your mind. And people, especially ladies, don't ever think that feelings dictate your thinking 
mos mendonen si është vjenja diktojnë mendimin tuaj, menduar tuaj. It's the way you think that dictates how you feel. Ja, mendura se si ju, është mendura se ju mendoni që dikton vjenja tuaj. We can never adjust our feelings, only medicate them. Ne nuk mund të regullojmë, nuk mund të heqim vjenjet, por vetë mund të mjekojmë ato. But we can adjust our thinking through renewing of our mind in scripture. Por ne mund të adresojmë atë duke ripërtërir mëndjen tonë, të mënduar i tonë nga shkrimi shenë. So where is your battlefield again? Ku është dhe njerë beteja juaj? Show me where your battlefield is. Ku është dhe njerë ku është beteja juaj? That's where your battlefield is. Ty është ku është beteja juaj. So we're going to look at ten desires. Su që të shikojnë në vjetë dëshira. As we go through these, think which ones are you. Edhe në rëkojnë e do të shikojnë këto vjetë dëshira, cila pre the first one is the desire for affection and approval. And I'm covering it because it's often us ladies. We just want to please others. <laughs> if other people get upset with us, we our day is ruined. It's hard for us to say no because if we say no, we might lose someone's affection and approval. So if this is your desire, the temptations that would would face you are confrontation. Someone ignores you. Someone doesn't affirm you. A powerful person who um, tries to run everything. So our desire for affection and approval is met with someone who steps on that. And when in our mind we think, poor me. I'm a victim of that person who isn't showing me affection. So what do we do in our actions? We just say yes to everyone, try to please everyone. We uh, let people mistreat us and walk all over us. We do things that we don't really want to do or we, they aren't really godly to do just to please other people. And the end result of death is that we feel depressed. We're not real. We're just getting walked on and we get angry inside and feel frustrated. So we need to renew our mind with scripture. Verse 12 tells us that we have to focus on Christ. Not on how others are treating us. And then we can be kind and treat others well no matter what they do. And we walk as a victor in victory in the blessing of God. So does anybody besides me have a desire for affection and approval? Yeah, right. Lots of us girls. Okay, the second desire we're going to look at is if our heart desires a partner. And you might not have this yourself, but you might know someone else who has this. If this person um, gets a little bit of attention, they latch onto it. This is the person you say hi to and then they send you a million texts. Um, a friend who calls you every day. Who acts possessive and clingy. This person feels they can't live without someone else to um, depend on. They learn to act helpless to try and get attention from others. 
If you have this desire, you just feel like you need someone to take care of you. <coughs> you, uh, you, say, you can into the shear shape, you can in the void for the coaches with desert for you. Mama's so, boys. So a desire for a partner is tempted by somebody who's nice. Somebody who's lonely. Somebody who's friendly and confident. And then the conception of sin in their minds is, I just need that person. I can't live without them. I have a right to be jealous of that person. I need that person. I can't function without that person. And if someone isn't treating that person just the way they want to be treated, they perceive rejection. And they act out in manipulation and fake helplessness. If you love me, you would do this. They act jealous and smothering. And, and you keep going down this path and pretty soon those jealous that jealousy becomes hostility. So the death is that they drive people away by their neediness. They can't handle rejection. They become hostile. <laughs> so we've looked at two, the desire for affection approval, the desire for a partner. Uh, I would say, in, in what we've dealt with, uh, a lot of times girls are more in love with the idea of getting married than they are of getting married themselves, who they're married. Uh, and we have a saying, because I'll try to explain to you what, how this goes about uh, in, in real life. Uh, a guy pursues a girl in, in high school. And then uh, finally uh, she rejects him. Uh, and then he starts telling all kinds of stories about her. That are for the most part aren't even true. We have, let me give you a warning. It seems like every woman wants to raise a mama's boy. But no woman wants to marry one. Uh, the solution for someone who desires a partner, remember what Jesus said in Matthew 10? I've come to set you apart, you are mine. The relationship with Christ is more important than any other relationship. Uh, number three, desire for public admiration. Uh, James 3 talks all about the tongue and how... Uh, uh, if we could tame the tongue, our entire life would follow. This is mostly male, but sometimes it can be a female. They want everybody's attention. The class clown, the rock star. But really, they want to be uh, the center of everybody's attention. They feel like they're always on a stage playing to a crowd. But one person's attention is never enough. They need the attention of everybody. And most of the time, inside is a very shy person. <laughs> 
El programa de las personas que son muy no pero cuando se en público, then they become very extroverted. El programa, por darle a estar en público, van a ser muy extroverted. So they, de they develop a private side and a public side. Pero si van a ser branchment, van a ser privada, van a ser muy público, van a ser muy fácil en público. Elvis Presley was very much like this. Elvis Presley is Uh, he, what he feared more than anything else was losing the adoration of people. And what this does is it drives people who have this desire to do things and, and to keep getting crazier to get that attention. Uh, the temptation is they are tempted by the applause or the laughter of people. Uh, and they, the lie they believe is that uh, if I'm not entertaining them, then they won't like me. Uh, and everybody is watching me. And if I'm not, uh, if, if I'm not the uh, center of someone's attention, or they don't love me. Now the actions would be the action would be uh, uh, being the class clown, clowny uh, classes for example and being someone different in public than they are in private. Now the death is, uh, they are not real. Uh, and they keep craving more and more attention. And they will self-destruct to get attention. Alright, and so what I need to understand is that I need to consider other people more important than myself. And quit making myself the focus of my life. There's two types of people in the world. One that walks into a room and says, here I am. And the other one walks in the room and says, oh, there you are. And the person in the room says, oh, yeah, we are. Now, number four, which is uh, basically a male problem. Uh, Diotrephes in the <coughs> John was this type of individual. This person is a, uh, a steamroller with a smile. Uh, he needs it's uh, it's his way or the highway. And he would never ever admit to a weakness in himself. And he rules as a dictator. Uh, he has to be in charge of every situation. And anyone who ever challenges him meets with his rage. Now at the same time, he feels contempt for weakness. And he makes fun of those who, are, uh, who aren't so macho. Uh, he is very good with his words and very good at arguing. And if that doesn't work, he'll even threaten or use violence. And to this individual, life is a contest where he must win every contest. Sports is a good outlet for someone like this. Now he's tempted by a weak person uh, with desire for affection and approval. I in fact don't know any person that affection and what you say and uh, uh, affection and approval. And, uh, number one. Uh, Look in your book to number one. She going to fire. And number four. She going to fire the captain. Are the most common miscast marriages. Where a dictator 
marries a doormat. It is a recipe for disaster. This man also says that I have to be seen as right, and if people challenge me, then I'm not loved. I need to prove to this person who challenges me that not only are they not right, but that I am way better than they are. Now the action is they focus on and point to the weakness in others. <laughs> They will rage out if they're challenged. They put others down, put others down to feel preeminent. And the death for them is that they anger and rage if not in a position of power. They cannot be led, they are the ones who cause the uproar, uproars within churches. And they discourage anyone else other than themselves who is uh, weaker than them. Uh, the, the antidote would be when I submit to authority and I'm a blessing to those who are in authority, I become a reliable member of the team. Number five. If there's any fathers here and another a number five comes to pick up your daughter, you lock your daughter in her room. <laughs> now, listen, girls. This guy is a smooth talker. Uh, males will use words of love to get sex. Females will use love to get word to, will use sex to get words of love. Now we have a deal. Ruth all right, uh, she rates the women. Not me. Because I can be duped by a woman. I say, oh, she's just being friendly. Ruth says she's not being friendly, she's being flirtatious. I say, we should give her a chance. <laughs> With the guys, I can. Ruth says, oh, he's a nice guy. And Ruth goes, oh, I see the answer. I say, he's a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> he's not truthful. <laughs> guys can see through guys, and girls can see, see through girls. <laughs> For the most part. <laughs> this guy here <laughs> knows how to use words to get what he wants. <laughs> He will promise a girl anything to get what he wants. He will throw around words like love and commitment like nothing. And he responds to no guilt all right, when he has broken those promises. He is very good at manipulating other people. And we're talking specifically about a guy with a girl. This is a smart individual. And a lot of times is able to, to gather a following behind him. The problem is, is that he goes by his own set of rules. But has the magnetism to draw people to him. 
uh, magnet that worked in the Hegel years of the event. Uh, as a young man grows into adulthood, he becomes a con man, a con artist. Can you understand? Yes, a con artist is someone. How would you say? Fake others out. What's that? How would you say? You're not. Now, uh, just so you understand, they will talk about rules and people, you know, following after rules. But in their mind, they think they're above the rules and special and they don't have to follow the rules. I would say to girls, quit listening and start watching. I would say, one of the things that I was attracted to Ruth about, she wasn't just nice to me. She was nice to the lesser thans in the youth group. A lesser what? Lesser thans, the uh, uh, people who are yeah, needy. The, uh, and I always take compliment juniors, but here it's a new transition of a person and a new kind of interest. These people here will only be interested in the people that make them look good. The fellow years is young, they are so hard. But in the fellow years, you burn out that you to do a mirror from that nature. And I hope all you girls are right now thinking, I know someone like that. And if for such a you guys are not only for a young person to deal, because these are the ones that cause a lot of problems for girls. And the subject of the person is just having some problem for guys. They are tempted by the ability to persuade a girl into a sexual relationship. Alright, uh, they can uh, they can talk people into doing what they want to do. Uh, they say that I can I can get whatever I want because I'm special. Uh, I understand the rules but they don't apply to me. If I can charm a girl and get what I want, it's her fault, not mine. And I just uh, I can get a girl to do what I want. It's her fault and not mine. Okay. I thought we want to buy you guys. The one that the boy is trying to do up. Look at five or five side. Okay. Now there are three basic actions that they 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 like to use in relationships. They are three. The prima cura sorts it over door in the 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 manure the the brewery the dura. First of all, they manipulate the girl. A tos pari manipulojn bajzen. If you love me, you would do this. And I thought, just a team don't want to push that. Whenever someone's trying to manipulate you, they use guilt. They try to make you feel guilty or fearful. And the good urge to decode the provision of the boy to shake that do one just one for during the end of five or also the freakers. Just on the dog walk. A girl has to be prepared before she goes on the date that nothing's going to happen. You guys do this for a date that for them and you, yeah, the one that has just gone off. And we'll talk more about this tomorrow. The first mushroom for the moment. Secondly, he uses women to get sex. And that's the duty I put on grab for the man for the man sex. And he will promise everything in the world to get what he wants. And I put on two John Bolt for the man for the child. With no commitment. Nothing will ever be. Now it appears that the Holy Spirit has been quenched in their life because they live apart from guilt. And they not only hurt themselves, but they lead other girls into sin and rebellion. Um, the sixth desire we will look at is a desire for prestige. This person wants social approval. They feel superior with sarcastic words. Gossip. Putting others down just to feel better about that. They uh, feel special if other people are jealous. So things like position in community, the type of house they have, the car they drive, the clothes they wear become all important. So there are a lot of temptations in the media today that lure this person's desire. Also, people in 
the church who admire materialism. Evet, persoane care își admiră materialismul. Oh, I want that. Yeah. Oh, cum <laughs> te <laughs> 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 oh, <laughs> you look at your house. So what are the conception of sin type of thoughts? You know, uh, look, I'm not as good as other people. I have to find a way to look better. Um, I need more. My house isn't good enough. If people look at me and see that I'm not as good, then, then I'll feel really bad. And, and the more uh, we've found as we've counseled, the more focus on the the house, the worse the relationship is. Generally speaking. So to feel better, they, they come up with sarcastic words. They put on an arrogant attitude. They have a drive to attain more. Whatever it takes to help others, to, so that others see them as better than they are. Shop like crazy to make the house better. You just got a new piece of furniture, I better get a new piece of furniture. Oh, I love these young girls. Close. They got, look at, she got that. Um, those jeans, I have to have that kind of jeans. Uh, yo, jeans, but they do It's the, they say to the girl, Oh, I like your jeans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is an empty, bottomless pit. They become willing to live in debt or do whatever it takes to, to, to attain more. And to gain prestige in others' eyes. If we meditate on scripture, just think about Jesus in John 13. How he washed the disciples' feet. Rather than what I have or how I look to people, I need to think about washing their feet. How can I really serve others? How can I deny myself? And um, be more about other people. So that no one knows about it. Uh, and the next one, okay. number seven, is achievement. All right. Let, let me just let me explain. Let us be good back then. Forty-five years ago, yeah. we met. Yeah. Uh, all right. Forty-five. Yeah. Forty-five. Best day of my years. life. This is the best. We had no party. We didn't have any other stuff. And uh, five years later, we got married. The past best year is in my tour because her parents wanted me to be twenty-one. And I, so the printer decided on to only change the name. I think she, they thought I was going to be mature then. <laughs> she was a wonderful, compassionate, strong Christian. But I grew up in a home where everything was just so. Perfect. And she grew up in not such a real nice home. So I thought, she's just about perfect, but I need to teach her how to take care of things. I don't know if I told you, but my parents divorced, and her parents, she never heard argue. Uh, we're going to celebrate 40 years of marriage. And when we, when we were first married, I put a ball hanging in the garage to teach her where to park. <laughs> now I don't care if she parks sideways. 
Instead of me teaching her, God has used Ruth to teach me what's important. But, but that bleeds into number seven. Uh, the desire for achievement. How many here uh, feel sick if they don't get a, an A in the class? In my masters, I took a B in Psalms, and I was sick for two weeks. And on the the seminar, more of both, when you be a nun, the shiva the ish a small burduja. And I didn't want anyone to know that I didn't have a perfect 4.0. I became a professional athlete because of achievement. When our oldest son uh, was 12 years old, one Sunday afternoon I was in the garage. And I always had to be fixing something. And I heard against the garage door him bouncing a ball and catching it. And I was convicted that here I am doing something that really doesn't need to be done and my son is out there playing catch by himself. And I remember that day making a commitment that I would play catch with my son before I would ever try to fix something. Now, don't get me wrong, without people that have the desire for achievement, this world would be a lot different. Everybody would be last in the class. And we appreciate those who have achieved. But it becomes a problem when I'm willing to step on people to achieve what I want. Or I get depressed because I didn't get a perfect score. Also, being a depression, so someone come out of the or I become emotional because I lost the game. Also, I'm emotional because I'm overloaded. And a lot of times, what this this overrides or, or covers personal inferiority feelings. And the kjopa stay full of on the end of the inferiority. The the temptation is I want people to say. Oh, you're very good. You're very smart. You're extremely macho. The thought, the thought patterns is I have to do well or else people won't love me. So I could never live with failure. I must succeed at all costs. These are people who become workaholics and men, this is a danger. Because the curse on men is not simply that we have to work. The curse on men is that we idolize our job. And so when a man meets another man, what's the first question he asks? It's not, do you have pictures of your babies like women do? <laughs> it's what do you do for a living? Uh, we fall to the sin of being identified by what we do for a living. Uh, and so they will sacrifice relationships uh, for, to succeed in a job. These people struggle to have fun, they can't seem to relax. And the wife and children that they have uh, realize 
that achievement is more important than this relationship. Very dangerous for pastors. The eighth desire that we will look at is it called the desire for moral perfection. So this person um, thinks that they are loved if they are being good. They seek the praise of others and try to do anything to avoid being criticized. But they've elevated um, perfection to such a point that they're critical and demanding of others. So we define perfection apart from God's standard, which is humility. <coughs> Uh, we define uh, God, perfection. Uh, of God. Right. I have, I have some definition of good that I've made up myself. With a big, big guilt button. Uh, they come button not to do for myself. And for other people. And this person is ungrateful for and unaware of God's grace. So we're tempted by legalism and rules. And people who make very straight standards, you have to dress a certain way, educate a certain way. It becomes more important than relationship with Christ. So what are the, what's the conception of sin? We think uh, I'm good if I have a certain way, if I have a certain type of family. I am better than other people because I keep these rules. Um, so we are on, in our actions, we're ungrateful. For the grace of God, it's For a very negative way of thinking. Critical, treating others with contempt. We're anxious and worried because what if I do the wrong thing? I'm not characterized by gospel, mercy, and grace towards others. The death, the death is that we're demanding no one can ever be good enough. And we raise children who rebel against the hypocrisy of living by standards and rules. We would lead people down the path of religion rather than the path of Christ's mercy and grace. Yeah, yeah. Christianity is defined more by what I don't do and a little bit by what I do. So we don't understand uh, double imputation. My sin is imputed on Christ. And his righteousness is imputed onto me. We don't understand that we have no righteousness apart from Christ. If we, if we met, read Philippians 3, meditate on the fact that I have the righteousness that comes by faith in Christ, not the righteousness of the law. I am becoming whom I am by God's grace. Not a person who lives by law and rules. But a person who looks like Jesus. Humble all the way to the cross. You know, another thing, you can recognize this in yourself, is it, that you let other people know. You make sure that other people know the things you do or don't do. Okay, number nine, desire for self-sufficiency. Number nine, desire for self-sufficiency. 
So this person uh, likes to isolate themselves. The autonomous. Now, okay, this is if you're older, little, you know, like not a college age student, but you're older than that and uh, you're single, maybe you've met people like this, or maybe this is a struggle yourself. Uh, they, uh, they reject, re uh, they uh, evade rejection by pretending they're not really committed, they're, they're not really interested. They, re they reject, uh, they re reject, uh, they uh, evade rejection by remaining uncommitted. Yeah. Relationship is very important. <coughs> but inside there's a lonely person that really would like to be in a relationship. But they just uh, want to portray that, you know, no, everything's good, I, you know, I, I'm not really interested in a relationship. Uh, they don't want anybody in their comfort zone that they've uh, created for themselves. And they don't want conflict with anybody. Uh, they will claim a lot of times that they're bored with life or just, you know, not getting anything out of life. Or they're bored with this relationship or that relationship and that's why they just they don't see any reason to become committed. Uh, the real problem is they don't want to become vulnerable. Uh, they're trying to protect themselves. Now they're tempted by uh, uh, the potential of being rejected. I fear, that, I fear that this is becoming an epidemic, uh, especially in our churches. Because young men don't want to ask out girls uh, to go for coffee because they're fearful of being rejected. So I would, I've asked Ruth uh, to teach the girls how to flirt with a guy so that he knows that she might be interested. <laughs> I don't think that's bad. Uh, 45 years ago, I thought I pursued Ruth. Now, I just realized now I've stepped in a lot of traps, which were, which were well set. Capiche? All right. But they, what they believe, what they want to say is it's easier to be alone. I don't need anyone, and if I can stay single, then at least I won't get hurt. They build a wall around themselves, and they don't want to become vulnerable. Uh, and the other bad part of this is they don't allow accountability in their life. So they're never vulnerable, they're never accountable. And they don't let others in the church stir them on towards love and good deeds. And rather than being part of a body and eventually becoming part of a family, they become an individual. Isolation. So the t last one we're looking at is the desire to restrict our lives. So this person acts shy. Just be it. in a crowd. Easily embarrassed in conversation. If I talk, I might say the wrong thing. And just 
So we fear making a mistake. And stay stuck in a nothing job. Because I'm afraid to try something new. The unreal world of games or romance novels is a great temptation. We counseled one woman, a um, couple actually, and the woman had been involved in 21 hours a day gaming, internet gaming, 21 hours a day. She had three children. <laughs> she had a computer relationship with an avatar. She made herself into one avatar and had a relationship with another avatar. <laughs> and brought her into the city in a really dangerous situation. But the unreal world, we have to be careful to stay in the real world. And not resort to daydreaming and fantasizing. We find all kinds of ways to replace reality. And restrict our lives. Our church family. So we're tempted by the fear of failure. Pop up leads in the browser of your computer. Internet porn. Illicit, illicit web relationships. And we say in our minds, I can't fail with people. I can't handle rejection. I'll say the wrong things if I meet new people. My daydream and fantasy world is safe for me. Our actions, our embarrassment. Uh, we live with our head like a turtle in a shell. Acting shy and quiet. And non-responsive. The death is we live in a fake world. We don't establish relationships. And it, of course the downward spiral into porn addictions or gaming addictions. Meditate on the word of God which says we do not fear but we have power and love and a sound mind. First in one seven. God is not giving us a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. Care about other people. We're done for this evening. Okay, but okay. You you have some information here. The first time we taught this probably a dozen years ago in our church, there were people walking around and saying to me, oh, they're a number four. And I said, oh, I actually got it. Uh, they're a number seven. I said, we taught that so you would look at yourself. No. So go home tonight and before you start thinking about who everybody else is, take a look at yourself. And some of you will have one very strong, and some will have several. And you'll go home and realize that you're schizophrenic. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Yes. But there is a now.